Well, it's Friday again, end of week six. I'm pretty tired as usual, but roll the titles on life as a CTC cadet pilot. So it's Friday, as I said, end of week six, and uh, well, what have we been up to this week? Well, it's been principles of flight and general navigation. Uh, it's been a, sorry about that. Uh, it's been a lot of early starts this week, mostly eight fifteen, eight thirty. So early starts, early get up. I've been going to bed at like well, I've not seen anything past eleven o'clock, so quite early for me, considering when I wasn't at CGC, I was regularly going to bed at midnight, so it's one of the things to bear in mind if you come to CGC, you can say goodbye to late nights if you want to do well. So, before I get into Principles of Flight and Genav, which is what I've been doing during the week, uh, the weekend before actually, I was doing quite a lot of question bank related I items for general navigation. Like I said, it's a very large topic and a lot and there is a lot that has to be memorised for it. So working through the question bank, it was a way of me, how do we say, drill the formulas into my head. Started with open book, and then throughout the evenings of this week in my spare time, I've been doing at least one exam every evening. Initially open book, and it got to about halfway through the week, and uh, I started an exam, bearing in mind there's 60 questions in a general navigation exam, and you've got two hours to do it. That's another thing, two hours for 60 questions. It sounds like enough time, but trust me, it isn't. it's tight on time if you don't know your stuff. So I was going to sit down and do an open book exam, but then I realised I got 10 questions in and I hadn't, hadn't opened up the folder. So I thought, well, blow it. I might as well give a closed book exam and go and see what my score comes in. And it did come in at a pass mark, so I was pleased with that. But I did the same thing ne next night. I thought, let's just make sure it's not a fluke. Did the same thing. And I got the exact same mark, different bunch of questions. So it looks like I've improved on GenNav, I will admit. Last Sunday I was pulling my hair out a bit, I was getting quite stressed about it because at that point we were only, we was only three weeks away from our real exams, two weeks from the mocks. Speaking of mocks actually, we've just had our schedule through for the mocks. Uh, they're not next week, they're actually the week after, but they're on the, I think it's the Tuesday and Wednesday. So yeah, so anyhow. We've been, I've, I've been doing a lot of gen nav. Uh, last couple of evenings I've been doing human performance. Uh, I'm now up to a closed book pass mark. Although we've spoken to some of the guys that's, because we had some guys down from Coventry uh, during this week to sit their mod ones. And apparently the human performance exam is in, including a lot more psychological uh, questions, which for me is a bit of a weak point because the questions I've been getting wrong has been a psychology question, so that's definitely something I need to work on. So, special thanks to the Coventry guys for stopping to have a chat with us after their exam. I'm sure they were very stressed and just wanted to get home. So, JNAV and Principles of Flight. Uh, I think we had four days of Principles of Flight and one day of JNAV. Uh, principles of Flight, uh, we've covered stability, propellers, high speed flight. I'm just looking at the list uh, behind the camera. So stability, propellers and high speed flight is the main areas that we've covered. Uh, we've only actually got two more chapters to do which will be covered next week, we've only got one more lesson on that. Uh, stability, so what is stability? It's essentially the ability for an aircraft to maintain its current light altitude and head heading. So if an aircraft's trimmed out straight and level it should stay there even if you get hit by a bit of turbulence it should come back to its original state. I mean, you could say that's positive stability and then you've got negative stability is the opposite. Like if it gets nudged a bit, then it's going to, wee, you're going to have a bad day. Um, yeah, that's, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but anyhow, propellers. Uh, yeah, we were just talking about various different types of propellers. So you've got your fixed pitch propeller. Uh, for me, when I was buying the Cessna 152 and occasionally the 172, they both had uh, fixed pitch propellers. It was a funny moment when our instructor thought a Cessna 152 existed with a variable pitch prop. I think they do exist, but they're extremely rare. So we had a bit of a laugh at that moment. It was just like, really? Variable pitch 152? Come on, that's not going to happen. 
So anyhow, um, high speed flight. Well, high speed flight. Um, we're getting up into the supersonic era. So anything past the speed of sound, which is known as Mach one. Um, you can start getting effects of high-speed flight, well, negative effects, that is, even as low as Mach 0.75. And it can get really interesting as you get near the sound barrier, because the way the wing works, it, the air flying over the top of it is actually going faster than ambient air. So you could be doing Mach 0.85, for example, but the air going over your wing could be doing Mach 0.105, for example. So it means even though you're not doing the speed of sound, I mean, yeah, basically you, the air flying over the wing is going faster than the speed of sound, so you're going to get shockwave issues, which, if not handled correctly, can cause a, well, you could say a bad day. So it's very important in commercial aircraft that aren't designed to fly supersonic that you avoid supersonic speeds because they can rip an aircraft apart. But if your aircraft's designed to go at supersonic, it's going to get fun. So that's pretty much principles of flight for this week, uh, in a very brief nutshell. We also had Gen Nav for one day and we got a hell of a lot done. I mean, our instructor for that, hats off to him. He knows how to get through stuff quickly, but he makes sure we understand it all before we move on. So hats off to him. You know who you are. So uh, I'm going to look at my list again. I've got it on the wall here. So. Uh, let's kick things off talking about time. We actually had a really funny moment at the start of uh, the class. The clock above the whiteboard actually stopped working and our instructor thought, oh, we'll get that going again. So he took it down, thought he got it going, put it back up on the wall, and when he started writing on the wall, wall to uh, room, the start of the section about time, the clock actually fell off the wall and hit him on the head, which I find quite ironic considering he was about to teach us about time, so... <laughs> That was quite entertaining, that was. Uh, various time, I mean, the way we look at time is, is how to convert it from one unit to another. When I say unit, we're talking about things like standard time, uh, UTC and local mean time, LMT. So standard time, that is what your local government sets. So uh, if take, for example, oh, I don't know, the state of Florida, I think you're five hours behind uh, UTC, which is Greenwich mean, mean Time. That is set by your local government. Uh, UTC, that is the time at the Greenwich Observatory in London. That is where all of the world's clocks are set from. Then we have local mean time. Now that is based on your exact longitude on the planet. So take Southampton, for example. I think we're about two or three degrees west. So our local mean time is actually going to be a bit different to UTC. For example, if it's, uh, I won't give exact times, but say for example, I'm well, like right now I'm in Southampton, UTC, which is at Greenwich, local mean time there is going to be a few minutes ahead of us. Uh, one of the things that we do cover is, for example, sunset and sunrise is given in local mean time, so you know you have to convert that into UTC to know when you can land whether it's uh, day or night, or even twilight. And that brings us on to our ne next subject. When is sunset, sunrise, and twilight? Well, it's given to us in what's known as a air almanac. And it's a basically a great big take. Actually, now I think of it, I've got it here somewhere, I've got the folder. Let's crack it open and see if I can find the almanac. I would like to show you an example of what it looks like. Here we go. Let's see if we can... The old folder's getting a bit full, so that's, that's always a sign that there's an exam coming up. So here we go. What year is it? Well, for our examples, we've been using the 1988 Air Almanac, and this gives us like time zones. So, for example, uh, let's have a look. Hong Kong is eight hours ahead of UTC. We can look it up on there, and that's how we can convert from UTC to standard time or local time as a lot of people refer to it as. And then, so let's open this up, so here, a bit more of the almanac, so we've got our sunrise table here, sunset, this is for the month of April and a bit of May. So we can look up what, la what latitude are we at, so for example if we're at North 50 and the date is the 5th of May on the, in 1988, this is, so it's going to be a little bit different nowadays, but the sun would have risen at 0430 in the morning. 
On the back we have morning civil twilight and even civil twilight. This is basically when the sun is below the horizon but there is some light uh, occurring on the ground so you can still fly, that's not, twilight is not classed as night so you can still fly in that in day VFR conditions but it's not advisable but it's quite nice to know that. So let's put that away, put that back somewhere safe, don't want to be losing that, it's got my notes in it. So anyhow, what else have I got to cover? Uh, Air Almanac, oh yes, specific fuel consumption uh, and SGR, I can't remember what that is actually, I'm going to have to revise that after this, but anyhow, it's basically working out fuel burn, it's the calculation you can do in the air. A lot of aircraft readouts will tell you what your S FFC and SGR is, and from that you can work out, have I got enough fuel to get to my destination within safe limits? So on a similar line to that, you can also work out the max range of an aircraft based on how much fuel you've got, how fast you're going, what's your fuel burn, etc, etc, you know where that's going. Uh, I, mean, I can't read my writing. What is that? Oh yeah, wind correction angle. Uh, you can work work out just by looking at your watch angle. I haven't got my watch on. But by looking at your watch you can get a pretty good estimate of how much of the wind, at what angle it's coming from, how much that wind is, a headwind, tailwind, crosswind component, etc. Yeah, we've been told that's quite good when it comes to our instrument rating. Um, what's the last one? Oh yeah, relative velocities. This is a good good one. So the kind of question we can get for a relative velocity is um, an aircraft passes overhead DME at 1421 hours, it's doing 300 knots. And then you can have another aircraft that will pass over that DME four mi minutes later and it's going faster, say 400 knots. And the question will ask you, when will the when will aircraft B overtake aircraft A, and what distance from the DME will it occur? Obviously, these two aircraft will be on the same heading. It's quite interesting, really. I mean, I used to not enjoy Gen Nav because uh, I didn't feel I was well. I wouldn't say not good at it, but I didn't feel like I was on top of it. Whereas I've been doing quite a few question banks this week, and I feel like I'm more on top of it. So, regarding the exams, we're less than three weeks away from the real thing, and. We're less than two weeks away from the mocks, which you have to pass at CTC, otherwise they won't let you sit the real thing. So that you have to treat them very seriously, they're no joke. So let's go on to what's going to happen next week. Well, next week is a shorter week. We're going to have one lesson of principles of flight. Now we'll finish up the last two chapters, so we can do a bit of revision at the end of that day. And at the moment, we're scheduled for two general navigation days, but we've been told by our instructor we're probably only going to need one of those. Apparently, uh, that morning, we're going to finish off the chapters that we haven't yet done, and then in the afternoon, we're going to do a, an exam. We've been told we can either do it open book or closed book. Me, personally, I think I'll do it closed book just to see how I'm doing as a whole. So it looks like we're going to have three, what's known as computer-based study days, or CBT for short. And then it will be the weekend, and then we have our mock exams. So I think, well, from now onwards, it's going to be head down in books, in the question banks, working our backsides off, and building up for the uh, Mod 1 exams. I will admit, a little bit nervous, but looking forward to it. It's unbelievable how, how fast these first six weeks have gone. So that just about wraps up this week's summary. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Feel free to, to subscribe. I can never say that word properly. Subscribe. Anyhow, uh, if you know someone who might enjoy this, feel free to share it with them. And I'll try and film a vlog for next week. But no guarantees because we're building up to the exam season. But if I can, I will. But on that note, I will see you in week seven.